Um, well, we'll go ahead and get started. We're super excited to, um, to be here this evening. Um, good evening, my name is Eric Carpio. I'm with History Colorado. I'm here tonight with uh, our featured speaker, Dr. Michael Sawyer. Uh, tonight's event is part of History Colorado's Borderlands of Southern Colorado online lecture series offered by our three Southern Colorado community museums uh, that are part of History Colorado. El Pueblo History Museum in Pueblo, Fort Garland Museum and Cultural Center, uh, which is where I'm physically located at, and then the Trinidad History Museum. Before we begin tonight's program, in the spirit of healing and education, we acknowledge the 48 contemporary tribes with historic ties to the state of Colorado. These tribes are our partners. We consult with them when we plan exhibits, collect, preserve, and interpret artifacts, do archeological work, and create educational programs. We recognize these indigenous peoples as the original inhabitants of this land. As always, I'd like to thank the Sangre de Cristo National Heritage Area and Colorado State University Pueblo for their continued support of our online lecture series. If you'd like to join uh, in support of our lecture series, we invite you to support this initiative by contributing to our Borderlands project at coloradogives.org. I'll drop the link in the chat box uh, later this evening. As you know, all of our Borderlands series uh, lectures are offered on a donation basis. So your support will allow us to continue and expand these programs into the future. Tonight is the first event in our summer fall lecture series. Uh, we just wanna thank all of you who joined us in April and May. We took a little bit of a pause, uh, but we're happy tonight to kickstart the event or the series again. We've got some really great programs coming up in September and into October. And I'll share a little bit about that at the conclusion of tonight's event. So at this time, it's my pleasure to introduce tonight's guest, Dr. Michael Sawyer. Dr. Sawyer is an assistant professor of race, ethnicity, and migration studies and the Department of English at Colorado College in Colorado Springs, which I know we've got several attendees from the Springs on this evening. He was recently appointed the Distinguished Visiting Professor of English and Fine Arts at the United States Air Force Academy, and he's the founder and director of the Africana Intellectual Project at, also at Colorado College. Uh, in March, he published his most recent book, Black Minded, The Political Philosophy of Malcolm X. Dr. Sawyer, welcome. We're excited to have you with us this evening. I really appreciate it, Eric, and thanks so much for the invitation. The, uh, it's, it's really a pleasure to see everyone joining. I realize this is not ideal. We really would like to have been able to do this in person, but this is the best we can do with what we've got. So I really appreciate all the participation and hope that we can have some interesting dialogue. Uh, it's a real, real pleasure that I'm able to join you today to spend some time discussing the Buffalo Soldiers in detailed fashion, and in some way attempting to situate that history within the long history of Black people in the Americas, and more specifically to understand the relationship of service to citizenship. In many ways, this offers me an opportunity to reconcile at least three similar talks I've given over the last four or five years. The first was the keynote address for the United States Air Force Academy's 2016 Black History Month. In approaching that discussion, I focused my attention on a meditation on the motto of the Academy, integrity first, service before self, and excellence in all we do. And thinking with that motto, I offered it as a question, how does one maintain the integrity of the self while offering service to a nation state that is in many ways failed citizens of color, and even in the face of undeniable progress has much to improve upon. I've got a slideshow, I'll start this and then we can have a possibility of, of viewing these slides. Let's see, I wanna get this ready. You can let me know if this is working right. I can't seem to. Eric, can you take a look and see if you can share the, the slides for me? I can't get it. To work. Oh yeah, I can do that for you. Yeah, I appreciate it. Got something weird going on. We can go to the uh, second slide. Uh, the next one's fine. 
so as I was saying, this gives us an opportunity to think about the ways in which service is a complicated notion for people who are marginalized in society. I propose it's productive to employ the thought of W.E.B. Du Bois, this is the quote we have here. First, his canonical admonition from his 1903 treatise, The Souls of Black Folks, that reads, quote, for the problem of the 20th century is the problem of the color line, close quote, along with his complex formulation from the crisis that I will quote indulgently with provocatively proposes the following. This is the quote we have here. The crisis says, first your country, then your rights. Certain honest thinkers amongst us hesitate at the last sentence. They say it is all well to be idealistic, but is it not true that while we have fought our country's battles for over 150 years, we have not gained our rights? No, we have gained them rapidly and effectively by our own loyalty in time of trial, close quote. One reading of this implies that Du Bois wishes to place the onus of citizenship upon the aggrieved and marginalized subject. I propose perhaps a more nuanced reading that recognizes that Without the possibility of service, there can be no discussion regarding its benefits. What I mean is that it is the moral responsibility of structures of exclusionary power to dismantle the barriers that have been erected to inclusion. What I believe Du Bois means is that once that impediment has been removed, then the possibility of service facilitates the achievement of rights by the formerly excluded subject. But the opportunity is only one element of the solution to this problem. Du Bois is well known in the days after World War I for fiercely advocating for, opening the, for the opening of the armed services, particularly the combat arms to African-Americans. We know as well as anyone that it was not until President Truman issued Executive Order, order 9981 in 1948 that the barrier of discrimination was dismantled. That order reads in part, you can change the slide there. It is hereby declared to be the policy of the president that there should be equality of treatment and opportunity in the military for people of all races religions, or national origins. The next talk that I believe forms an important lead up to the conversation we're gonna to have today regarding the Buffalo Soldiers was in 2019, again at the Air Force Academy on the occasion of a celebration of the Tuskegee Airmen. In that talk, I elected to explore the notion that black people were considered to be inferior to white people, and that served as the reason for denying them access to flight training. In Charles River, editor's history of the airmen, the following quote sets the context of marginalization that required resistance. Quote, when World War II started, the black press and the black community wanted blacks to fly because in 1925, the military had done a study that said blacks didn't have the intelligence, ability, or coordination to fly planes. Close quote. With that in mind, the fact that the Tuskegee Airmen necessarily refuted the notion that I argued against with James Madison's notorious assertion in Federalist 54 that rendered enslaved Africans only partially human. It's worth repeating these words from the primary frame of the United States Constitution that we hold so dear to in some small way witness the scope of the headwinds facing the achievement of a citizenship by people of African descent. Next slide, please. Madison writes, and this is from Federalist 54, but we must deny the fact that slaves are considered merely as property and in no respect whatever as persons. The true state of the case is that they partake of both those qualities being considered by our laws in some respect as persons and in other respects as property. And being compelled to labor not for himself, but for a master and being bendable by one master to another master and being subject at all times to be restrained in his liberty and chastised in his body by the capricious will of another, the slave may appear to be degraded from the human rank and class with the irrational animals which fall under the legal denomination of property. The federal constitution therefore decides with great propriety on the case of our slaves when it views them in the mixed character of persons and property, close quote. In my mind, one of the most insidious elements of the legacy of that, the enslaved condition is this explicit notion codified by Madison, the people of African descent are considered to be only partially human. Madison bent the logic to facilitate the project of writing black people out of the constitution while simultaneously writing them into it through the compromise of our humanity. The dehumanization of black people in all realms of life across the decades that span the late 18th century to a variety of forms of mistreatment in our world today exemplified by this compromise. It's clear to me the driving force behind much of what we understand to be the civil rights movement and its associated human rights initiatives was, the necessary, was necessary to establish the humanity of black people first and foremost. The third step that leads me to this talk was the delivery of the keynote address in the summer of 2016 at the occasion of the dedication of the Buffalo Soldier Memorial in Colorado Springs. In that address, I focused on the binary propositions of memory and memorial to unearth their importance in establishing that marker for the Buffalo Soldiers. That physical memorial grants us a handhold for dragging our memories from the past into the present, but it holds them in place to prevent their slipping away. 
it is just holding in place a type of marker that seems to me to be the real power of the concept behind the memorial as an idea. In that talk, I cautioned that any memorial can mean different things to different observers. The memorial of the memory of the Buffalo Soldiers will mean something very different to members of the armed forces who, who see a genealogy of valorous struggle in these soldiers and their stories as compared perhaps to members of the Native American tribes who were embroiled in this complex and devastating struggle for land that held both of these subjects, African and Native American, is beneath the status of human. This must be understood and responsibly engaged to ensure that we do not recreate with our practice silence the same type of erasure that requires that monument in the first place. Understanding that we all bring our own self-consciousness to our experience of monuments. This is all in some measure mind-numbingly mind -numbingly complex, but I will do my best to synthesize what we have encountered so far in order to provide a bridge to our discussion of the Buffalo Soldiers. As a practical matter, at least since roughly 1619, the status of people of African descent in this country has been situated as that of at best resident and at worst subject to the terrorism of slavery, Jim Crow, segregation, and or mass incarceration. I've often received an incredulous response from students and even audiences that include people who must intuitively know that having been the first child born into my extended family in 1967, I was also the first person who had the expectation of the right to vote and that the Voters' Rights Act was only passed in 1964. My father was a member of the 4th Infantry Division in the Vietnam War, a war in which he was drafted from a county in rural Alabama that did not have a single black person registered to vote. What this means is that until the very recent past, my lifetime basically, service was demanded from black people without the binary expectation of the right to attend citizenship. In spite of this obvious dichotomy in this, the years following the devastation of the Civil War and the failure of reconstruction in the South, the Buffalo Soldiers were formed being exemplar of a structure of duties basically without rights. Here we will lean heavily upon the text by Chaplain T.G. Stewart entitled Buffalo Soldiers, the Colored Regiment, the Colored Regulars in the United States Army that was originally published in 1984 by the AME Church. Please uh, pull up the next slide, Eric. I cannot recommend this book more enthusiastically to anyone who is interested in this history. Chaplain Stewart opens the text with a letter from 1899 that was sent to him by Lieutenant General Nelson A. Miles that is excerpted here. It reads, next slide, please. Uh, next one, I think. No, I think we skipped. If you can go back to, I think, I'm sorry. One more. Yeah, this one, I'm sorry. The one that starts, dear sir. There we go. This is from Lieutenant General Nelson A. Miles. It reads, Dear Sir, you will remember that my acquaintance with Negro character commenced during the Civil War. The colored race then presented itself to me in the character of numerous contrabands of war and as a people who individually yearned for the light of, and life of liberty. Ages of slavery had reduced him to the lowest ebb of manhood. From that degree of degradation, I've been an interested spectator of the marvelously rapid evolution of the downtrodden race. The first regiment which I commanded on entering the regular army of the United States at the close of the war was made up of colored troops. The regiment, the 40th Infantry, achieved a reputation for military conduct, which forms a record that may be favorably compared with the best regiments in the service. If so early in the second generation of the existence of the race and the glorious might of liberty, it produces such orators as Douglas, such educators as Booker T. Washington, such divines as the Afro-American bishops, what may be not expected of the race when it will, shall have experienced as many generations of growth, of growth as Anglo-Saxons who now dominate the thought, the inventive genius, the military prowess, and the commercial enterprises of the world. Very truly yours, Nelson A. Miles. There's much to consider here, but what I find most interesting is the lack of any discussion by the general regarding the citizenship status of the formerly enslaved and their offspring with a focus on how military service demonstrates a particular form of humanity, if not the threshold of manhood. What is made explicit is that so much of the notion of establishing the Buffalo Soldiers is related to dealing with the questions that remain unanswered at the time just after the Civil War and Emancipation. Just to establish a timeline here, next slide, please. In 1860, six all-Black cavalry and infantry regiments were created after Congress passed the Army Organization Act. Their main tasks were to help control the Native Americans of the Plains, capture cattle rustlers and thieves and protect settlers, stagecoaches, wagon trains, and railroad crews along the Western Front. As many of you will be familiar, no one seems to know exactly why these soldiers were dubbed Buffalo Soldiers, but the Native Americans they encountered, by the Native Americans they encountered, and we can leave that type of speculation to the side. 
whatever the reason, the name stuck and the African-American regiments formed in 1866, including the 24th and 25th Infantry, which were consolidated from four regiments, became known as Buffalo Soldiers. For instance, the 10th Cavalry was based in Fort Leavenworth, Kansas, and commanded by Colonel Benjamin Grierson. Mustering then was slow, partly because the colonel wanted more educated men in the regiment and partly because of a cholera outbreak in the summer of 1867. In August of 1867, the regiment was ordered to Fort Raleigh, Kansas, with the task of protecting the Pacific Railroad, which was under construction at the time. Before they left Fort Leavenworth, some troops fought hundreds of Cheyenne in two separate battles near the Saline River. With the support of the 38th Infantry Regiment, which was later consolidated into the 24th Regiment, the 10th Cavalry pushed back the Native Americans who were dedicated to protecting their land. The historical archive grants us precious little access to the actual thoughts of the soldiers in question. We have to piece together the conditions here by reading between the lines of communiques provided by the officers in charge. The notion of authority is one that we have to deal with. In spite of thinking like that of Lieutenant General Miles, there's little consideration of the notion that Black officers might be trained to serve as commanders of these all-Black units. The notion of Black people being in charge at this stage of the narrative mirrors my overarching concern here about the instability of citizenship that was left unresolved for almost 100 years. What I mean is, is to be a citizen is to have a predictable relationship to the duties of that status that are, in the ideal case, balanced out by rights. Next slide, please. This slide is meant to depict that relationship. Generally, this operates outside of our awareness, but that is only because we have resolved this relationship or at least become comfortable with the manner in which the society operates. One can imagine many examples of this, but in the historical example before us, it did not function properly. Example one, we can think about the requirements of voting, right? Where they're balanced by the commensurate, you have the duty to vote, it's, it's balanced by the commensurate right to exercise the franchise. Next slide, please. Here we have an illustration of what we are describing by this brand of fractured citizenship, where there are too many duties versus the number of rights. And you see how this imbalance happens. Uh, next slide, please. This depicts something like privilege where the burden of duties is disproportionately light when compared to rights. When we think about the authority structure here where the Buffalo Soldiers regiments were generally under the proximate command of white officers, we are able to witness the way in which they were a microcosm of the United States. To grant the possibility of being in charge of your situation, to work your way along a predictable line of reasoning to the point of authority, is to experience the promise that is built into the question of citizenship. Citizens of this country grow up with the promise, at least implicitly, that to the extent they fulfill all of their duties and further to the extent that they do as well, they can be elevated to the point of authority. Here, these black soldiers who couldn't vote and were only marginally, if at all, considered citizens were not in a position to make their interests heard in, any, in order to do something like charge, change the policies that govern their situation. This is not to say that there were no black officers at the time. And what I would like to do next is spend a few minutes on the biography of one of them, Colonel Charles Young. Next slide, please. Charles Young was born March 12, 1864 in Mays Lick, Kentucky into slavery. Obviously both of his parents were both enslaved, but his family escaped to freedom in Ohio early in 1865. His father volunteered for the Union forces. After the war newly freed, the Youngs remained in Ohio and Charles was one of the three black students in his school who he, where he graduated at the top of his class in 1880. He taught school for several years in his community and in 1883 took the competitive exam for entry into the United States military test. He had the second highest test score and was admitted when the first applicant declined the appointment. Here it is quickly important that we are not distracted by this appointment into believing that the balance of duties and rights that we just explored had been effectively resolved. It was not. Young became the third African-American to graduate from West Point in 1889 but he endured terrible conditions his entire time there as a cadet. Shellam's book opens with a paragraph that gestures at the terrible conditions he endured. Next slide, please. When Charles Young graduated from the United States Military Academy at West Point in 1889, he hoped he ended a difficult chapter in his life. His five-year struggle to earn his coveted diploma and receive a commission as a second lieutenant in the U.S. Army was full of challenge and triumph. Young had to face the or this ordeal in a racially charged atmosphere where most of his classmates ignored him or refused to have anything to do with him, yet he persevered and graduated. Close quote. The Buffalo Soldier Regiments had been the destination of the two black cadets who were commissioned before Young, and his assignment was the same. He was detailed to the 10th U.S. Cavalry on September 14, 1889. In spite of this initial assignment, while home in Ohio on leave and prior to reporting, his assignment was changed. Young protested to the War Department, asserting that he would already 
ordered and paid for the necessary cavalry uniforms, and that will be and they will be useless in an infantry regiment. His assignment was reconsidered. He was ultimately assigned to the 9th U.S. Cavalry, where he reported in November 1889 at Fort Robinson in Nebraska. One should not be fooled into believing that things went well for Young or any other Black person in service at this time. The challenges of Jim Crow and marginalized citizenship were as omnipresent in the Army as they were in American society. I encourage you to read Brian G. Salem's book to get into the details of this remarkable life, but let's suffice to say that up until the last moment of his storied existence, Colonel Charles Young excelled against these headwinds. One important period of his professional life was his assignment, was his assignment as a military science instructor at Wilbur Force University, the nation's oldest privately operated African American college or university in September of 1894. This was also an irregular assignment that officers were generally to serve more than five years with the regular forces before being deemed seasoned enough to leave their units and be away from the Army. However, this was a fortuitous assignment for the history of our country because at Wilbur Force, Young became close friends with two of his colleagues, the poet Paul Lawrence Dunbar and W.E.B. Du Bois, who we, who we quoted earlier, whose concerns regarding military service we've already discussed. According to author David Levering Lewis in the biography of Du Bois, quote, Young's was the first genuine male friendship in Du Bois's life, one of a handful in which there was a genuine affinity, close quote. We cannot underrepresent, we cannot overrepresent the importance of this relationship and what it must have had, what the important must have had for both of these men. On the part of Du Bois, he was granted firsthand knowledge regarding the manner in which military service worked for African Americans, and Young could understand the world through the eyes of unarguably one of the most important thinkers of the 20th century. We could spend days discussing the career of Colonel Young, and in my own profession, I've spent years studying the intellectual production of Du Bois, but that's not what we're here for. What I want to approach now in some detail is an example of the fractured relationship between service and marginalized citizenship with some thinking in and around the 1917 race riot in Houston that is known as the Camp Logan Mutiny. Next slide, please. The riot began with an instance of police brutality, which I believe helps us to situate this event within the complications of our present moment. Briefly, the story is police in Houston brutally arrested a black woman who was putatively accused of hiding a black man in her home who was allegedly participating in a dice game. A soldier from the Buffalo Soldiers, in this case, case the 24th Infantry Corporal Charles Baltimore, interceded and asked if he could at least retrieve some clothing for the woman who had been dragged into the street barely clothed. For his trouble, Baltimore was beaten by two officers, Lee Sparks and Rufus Daniels, who were notorious for their brutality against Black people. He was shot and ultimately dragged into jail. Baltimore, in spite of his injuries, was released, but not before word got back to the 24th that he had possibly been lynched and up to 100 Buffalo soldiers armed themselves to march to the jail and scream if he were alive and to take revenge on the police who had been brutalizing Black people on a constant basis. Ultimately, the conflict resulted in the deaths of 19 people, 15 white and four Black. 118 Buffalo soldiers were arrested and charged with mutiny and a series of other charges, and 13 of them were hanged to death without due process. The point here, and I hope we can have some productive conversations, that the catalyst for this tragedy was a systematic harassment by police and white residents of the area of the, of the Black people, as well as the desire to marginalize the status of Black soldiers. The, even moving the base to the Houston area had been very, very controversial, and this is exemplar of that problem. Without taking the atmospheric conditions here, lawlessness on the part of police into account, 13 potentially innocent men were executed and hundreds more had their careers destroyed. Over the last decade or so, professors in the history department of the University of Houston have mounted a campaign across at least two presidential administrations to have these cases reopened in order to posthumously pardon the convicted. This is one of thousands of examples of the complexity of American political, social, and economic life for people of African descent that exist in spite of the desire to establish a practice and ethos of service in order to have a chance at full citizenship. By way of closing, I hope we have time for and I hope we have time for further discussion. I would like to circle back to where we start and tie up a few loose ends to make sure that the point here is made clear. So it seems that memorializing the Buffalo Soldiers is about their military service. To me, it's really more about the important calling in our society, the promise of full citizenship. I say this not to demean military service, but to emphasize the fact that it is in service, that it is in service literally to citizenship in particular. The opportunity to serve is really the opportunity to be a more particular type of citizen. That duty 
is to be met with the appropriate amount of rights. And when we consider the sacrifice of the Buffalo soldiers, it is imperative we recognize they did this to serve as an example to us about the depravity of mistreating our fellow human beings. They did not have the right to vote because if you can't vote everywhere in the nation, you're not in possession of this most fundamental and important of our rights. In closing and pouring these words is another form of moralization. I hope that we can be ever mindful of the sacrifices made by the Buffalo soldiers and the conditions under which they were made. And so doing we might imagine and bring into reality a more positive future and in some measure can begin to honor the lives and struggles of these heroes beyond statues, highways, books, and songs by building a world that they would recognize and improve upon their condition. Thank you. And I hope we can take some questions from the chat box. All right, thank you, Dr. Sawyer. Um, if anyone has questions, uh, feel free to drop them in the chat box at this time and uh, we'll feed them to Dr. Sawyer and he can answer any questions you may have. So there's a question to repeat the incident or the name of the incident in Houston. Sure, it was the, uh, it's known as the Camp Logan Mutiny, Camp Logan. And then first question we have from Leslie, um, why do you think that these men joined the Buffalo Soldier units? Um, what did they want to accomplish with their service? I think that's the, the salient question here, right? I think it's much about an attempt because many of these, these people were enslaved or, or were the children of, of the formerly enslaved necessarily, right? So the kind of point was to try to move west to kind of seek a better life, because the entire controversy regarding the Civil War in the first place had much to do about whether slavery was going to con con continue in the Missouri Territory. So as you move west, that question becomes uh, more fraught and destabilized. So much of it was about that. I think the, the foundational notion was the promise that if there was some type, sort of service that they could expect to be uh, receiving some type of equality and the right to vote, full citizenship, et cetera, and those kinds of things, but that simply was not the case. So there's a, another question asking if you can comment on the Beecher's Island morning of rescue. Let's see, the, uh, I'm sorry, I didn't see it. What's the, I don't, I'm not familiar with the event, so I'll have to get, but if you send me an email, I can, I can, I'll bone up on that and get back to you about that event. So the question about Young, um, it says with Young being from Kentucky, did he have any previous horsemanship background? Do you know, or how much knowledge of horses and horsemanship did early Buffalo soldiers um, have? I would imagine there would be some with the cavalry units, but, uh, is that something that yeah. you Yeah. I mean, Colonel Charles Young is legendary for his horsemanship in particular. I don't know where he picked it up, but some of it, he would have been his training at West Point because still at the time included a great deal of, of horsemanship training for people who were headed for the cavalry. But he was uh, forcibly retired when he was a lieutenant colonel. And in order to prove his fitness for office, he, he, took a, he rode a horse from Ohio all the way to Washington, D.C. to the War Department to kind of over, you know, no, there were no existence of, of roads in the way we understand it now, to demonstrate that he was still fit for, for service. So he was a notoriously um, adept horseman. You're muted, Eric. So there are, there are several questions in the chat box, I think, asking in different ways about the complicated history between the Buffalo Soldiers and, you know, conflict with um, and the charge to remove uh, Indigenous peoples from their land. So a couple questions, for example, asking if you're aware of any books around the Buffalo Soldiers from an Indigenous perspective. And then just, I think, generally, if you can speak about some of the complicated nature of that, that history. Yeah, there, I haven't, I've, I've looked for a kind of primary text on this from the perspective of indigenous people who haven't yet found one, but it's, it's the typical, it's the typical story of the complexity of American life, right? So you have a series of enslaved people who are basically 
pressed into a particular type of service in order to try to make themselves citizens. And the condition for doing that is to serve as a, as a military force, a coercive force to remove people from the land who were indigenous to it, right? So this is in many ways what people say, or when people talk about the fundamental flaws of the original sin of, of American Republic, this kind of dichotomous or paradoxical relationship is exactly that, right? And so there were all kinds of complications. I saw one question about whether the Native American population trusted or felt so safer dealing with the Buffalo soldiers. It's, it's relatively unclear. There's probably some of that. I mean, the important text on this is the, if you get a chance to refer to the, the story of Lewis and Clark, is York, who was, uh, I think Clark was owned by Clark. And he was the, the, the basically the intermed intermediary between Lewis and Clark and all the indigenous populations. He was a very talented linguist. And he literally served as the, as the, the translator for the entire trip under the promise that he'd be free when they got back to Virginia. Of course, that didn't happen. But that, again, speaks to this kind of complex relationship between um, formerly enslaved or currently enslaved people of African descent and the indigenous population. That's, that's very complicated in this country, particularly as you move further west and get towards the, the um, Indian, the, the clearing operations that happened under Jackson's administration. Great, thank you. I think because uh, we're located obviously here in Colorado, there's a few questions about um, if you can talk about some of the uh, Buffalo Soldier history and connection to Colorado or this region. Yeah, I mean, there's a great deal of history. I did a, a talk, you know, last year that, that talked about just the, the presence of the Buffalo Soldiers here. And it's the same story, right? As, as the move, as Movement West happened, many of these units left Fort Leavenworth, Kansas, and came toward to Colorado Springs to Bent's, to Bent's Fort. Bent's Fort is that, it's the Bent's Fort is, is where they were located here. And, you know, their job was exactly what we've been talking about, right? This notion of, of keeping safe settlers as they were moving further west and also participating and pushing and pushing the kind of clear land as as the country you know headed towards this notion of manifest destiny so colorado becomes you know the entire this the entire rocky mountain region becomes critically important in the story of westward expansion and all and that's and the buffalo soldiers necessarily serve as important uh elements of that the uh, i saw one question asked with a memorial the memorial park here in, in colorado springs is where the memorial happens to be and also this piece of highway as you leave Manitou and head into Colorado Springs is, is dedicated also to the Buffalo Soldiers. You'll see a, a, a marker there that, that memorializes that stuff. So Dr. Sir Lawrence is asking, he says, my question is, did soldiers truly expect to obtain equality for their service in the army? And I guess this goes to, you know, the motivation and, um, you know, are, are there primary sources around, you know, what soldiers who enlisted early on may have expected to gain from their service? Yeah, I mean, this is a story that goes all the way back to the Revolutionary War, right? Even Crispus Attucks, who was literally the first person to die in the conflict. And this question of service, whether, you know, this kind of promise during the Revolutionary War, uh, many people of African descent were attracted to the British side to fight for the British because they were promised their freedom. This is how Lots of um, formerly enslaved people ended up in Nova Scotia because at the end, close, of, close of the war, the British fulfilled that promise and basically packed them onto ships and sent them to Canada. And that's in many ways how the population, the black population um, ended up in Canada because of that, right? So what I'm kind of the point of the talk to make it explicit is to kind of interrogate this question of service and what it, how it relates to this question of citizenship, right? Um, the Roman notion of pro patria more, right? to die for the country even to place yourself in that position is supposed to, in, in, in the Western imaginary and democracy, is supposed to render you a particular type of, of super citizen. Right? We see this in our own existence. We could still fly on planes, as much, you know, when soldiers or, or uh, seamen, airmen, et cetera, are allowed to get on the plane before everyone else to kind of memorialize the fact that, that they have sacrificed in a particular way for the country and should be honored in even the, in even the smallest examples of that. So there's every reason to believe that these people who were coming from slavery, which, you know, it's hard to imagine anything worse than that, anticipated that if only they had very few options in front of them. So this was one of them, right? And some of that would include the kind of freedom of getting away from the places that they, the plantations that they've been enslaved on in the South and moving West with the hope that there would be some new, new type of life there. So they expected it. Um, 
it took a hundred or more years almost for for that promise to be fulfilled and we're still kind of working through this problematic in many ways today so i think related to that matt is asking um how buffalo soldiers were viewed by white americans um you know early in that time um you know he's speculating they're probably experienced violence and discrimination um you know what was that experience like and that relationship like yeah absolutely i mean this is what i was gesturing at to get to the point of this this uh race riot that happened in houston so the the fort there, there there was i mentioned briefly that there was this huge controversy about bringing armed black people there in the first place right so it was this huge push pushback from the local community uh, Congress, Congress people in the region to to force or to deny the army the right to kind of garrison armed black soldiers there. So what happens when they get there, the police become this kind of force against the presence of the, of the armed uh, soldiers there. And this is kind of constant conflict between the two. There have been, you know, several massacres, you know, we, we of, of uh, black members of the armed forces over time, right? There's a large massacre in New York City just at the close of the Civil War, where all the Union soldiers who were pursued, many of them chased down and killed by mobs of kind of white vigilantes. So the, the problematic is this tenuous, and this is, speaks to this question of citizenship, right? The question of whether Black people were eligible to be armed or not was foundational to this question and why Truman and many people were so reluctant to give arms to, to Black soldiers was just this question of a concern that then there would be some insurrection in the country and you have trained people who would then be able to kind of undermine the integrity of societal order. Great, thank you. Uh, there's several questions about uh, some of the resources that you mentioned or maybe other references. Um, Flo asks what sorts of first-hand accounts from Buffalo Soldiers exist? Are there any written record or accounts of Buffalo Soldiers? themselves describing time at Fort Garland or other Colorado installations, but can you talk about some of the research or if people are interested in doing their own, uh, you know, reading after tonight's talk, where would you point them to? Yeah, I mean, I think there, there's some, there's some pretty well done uh, accounts, historical accounts of the Buffalo Soldiers. I mentioned during the talk that there's very little uh, with respect to interviews or documentation from the Buffalo Soldiers themselves, right? So much of this happened, you'll see some of, some of it will come up in the WPA, right? The, the work project that, that Roosevelt started kind of during the Great Depression, but many of this, this was kind of 50 years on after the case. So some of that primary documentation is often viewed as suspect from the perspective of people who work on African-American history because they don't trust that people were actually telling the truth to the people they were speaking to, right? So you can imagine being some formerly enslaved person who's 60 or 70 years old and having someone come and say, tell me everything I need to know about being enslaved. The same existed for people within the armed forces, right? Who, who at one, who we understand are also not available to kind of make comment. It's also, you know, a court martial offense to be making these kinds of comments or to be talking about what's actually going on. So this is kind of silencing and erasure. That is the kind of core argument that I'm making here is that even in the memorialization of the Buffalo Soldiers, we still can't necessarily hear their voices because at the time, this question of literacy, the question of, of um, where they would actually publish this documentation, there were few of any historians working on the Buffalo Soldiers as an ongoing enterprise, right? So we're really in the process, and I'm a political theorist and philosopher, so I approach it from that direction, not from a perspective of, of kind of a hardcore uh, archivist or historian, right? So I'm more curious about the ways in which it questions the stability of democracy and the exemplar of the notion of service that doesn't function as the way we understand service to function in Western societal order, if that helps at all. But there's, I mean, I recommend, I mentioned a couple of the texts I recommend, but the one that I really found useful, I think is, is, is this, this by the chaplain T.G. Stewart, right? It's entitled Buffalo Soldiers, the Colored Regulars of the United States Army. This is a 1904 text that was published by the African Methodist Episcopal Church. So there's some element of, of uh, there's not as much mediation in that text as there might be in some other historical texts that were kind of written contemporaneously. And the Army's records are notoriously bad with respect to what was going on. 
So Carmen asks whether um, any Buffalo soldiers, to your knowledge, were denied citizenship after completing their service. But I think that also goes to a larger question. What's the experience once, once they leave service, right, and go back into uh, American life? Uh, there is another question, I guess, related to that around whether Buffalo soldiers organized politically, um, you know, after leaving service. So a couple of different questions, but do you mind talking about that? Yeah, I mean, I think they were never citizens, right? And that's, they were more, at this point, you know, this question of whether you're residents, whether you're almost, in some ways, uh, soldiers for hire, because you're, you're not going to achieve the kind of benefits of citizenship. So as I mentioned, you know, I, you know, 1964 is the Voters' Rights Act. We're talking about the 1880s, 1890s here. So we're 50 years ahead of, you know, 50 or 60 years, 70 years almost, right? Ahead of the kind of question of being able to vote at all for black people in this country. So that once you took the uniform off, you weren't allowed, they weren't allowed to vote while they were in the Buffalo Soldier Regiment. Let's say happened to be in some state at, you know, Northern state where they were afforded the right to vote during that period of time, which was not a franchise that was predictable. You have to understand that prior to the first great migration, roughly 95% of all people of African descent in this country lived in what we now understand to be the South, right? So literally when I was mentioning my father who came from Hale County, Alabama, when he moved to Chicago, that was part of the kind of second grade migration in the 19, early 19, mid 1960s of people leaving the South and moving to these Northern cities. And he came there without the right to vote from where he, he had come from. And so, you know, there, there's no reason to, to believe that that's really what was going on. As far as what, what happened, many of these people, you know, the Oklahoma, the, the Black Wall Street massacre is an exemplar of this, right? You had these Western communities would spring up and many of these people who would become the founding members of them had been members of the army who would come west in the first place. And there's several, uh, you know, horrible massacres where these, these towns were descended upon by mobs of kind of white people and everybody was summarily executed and the towns destroyed. So there's, you know, example of example after example, after example of just that type of, of uh, terror that was, you know, explicit kind of post uh, reconstruction, post uh, Jim Crow in that area of kind of really marginal segregation that was happening from the 1880s all the way up until including the 1950s and 1960s. So there, uh, you know, going back to the conversation about young, um, there's a question whether it, there were other soldiers that were able to uh, advance to the rank of officer um, and what was that process or that experience? Yeah, I mean, so I'm pretty familiar. I went to Naval Academy, so I always find it funny to always end up talking about these kind of Army people, particularly from West Point. But the Naval Academy didn't have its first, I think, actually no, if you can imagine this, I actually know the first African-American graduate of Naval Academy, which is outrageous in certain ways, right? I was class 89, and he was still alive. He was actually from Chicago, so I kind of met him. But these people, so Colonel Charles Young was the third graduate. Uh, the first uh, was ended up being court martial and his court martial had been overturned as well. He showed up, there was this controversy between, this is why they, and we didn't have time to get into it. This is why uh, Colonel Charles, Charles, second Lieutenant Young at the time, his assignment to the first unit was supposed to be switched because there was already another African-American graduate of West Point there who ended up being court martialed and kicked out of the army um, for basically trumped up charges. So you have to understand that assignment to these Buffalo soldier units for white officers was considered to be the kiss of death for your career, right? The last thing you want to be as an officer was to be assigned to be in charge of, of, of black soldiers. So they were, you know, if you showed up there as a kind of second lieutenant from West Point, you were white, you'd already had some chip on your shoulder for being there in the first place and it just, just did not go well. So there was always this tension. So those first three graduates all ended up at Buffalo Soldier uh, units and Colonel Charles Young becomes the most successful of them in many ways because he was able, to, when I mentioned that it was strange for him to leave the kind of operating army and go to Wilberforce at that time, that actually probably proved fortuitous for his career because it got him off the track of being around these kind of regular army units that were notoriously uh, invested in, in, in segregation, uh, Jim Crow and, and trying to marginalize uh, black soldiers and black officers in particular. Uh, 
So Tamara is asking about um, the history of um, uh, female Buffalo soldiers, and it brings to mind, at least in my mind, the story of uh, Cathay Williams. Uh, right. I don't know how familiar you are with that story, but do you mind sharing some of that? I think yeah, it's this, this is this is really interesting. There's actually a person here at, in in Southern Colorado who's working on trying to unearth the details of that historical example, where there was a a, a a woman who was posing as a man to kind of participate to be a member of the armed forces at the time within the Buffalo Soldiers. And so this is, there were several people from, there's an exa lots of examples of this during the Civil War. And we also see exemplars of this with respect to Buffalo soldier units, because again, it was this question of maybe this is the only opportunity they have to kind of get away from what was going on in the South kind of post uh, Civil War and post Reconstruction, where the Ku Klux Klan becomes this t domestic terror organization that's sweeping through the South. And this is where you have the kind of spike in lynching. So getting out of there, whether you're a man, woman, or child is is of, of primary importance. And we have an example of one person who actually uh, hid her gender in order to become a member of a Buffalo Soldier Union. And I think just going back to, to her story, I don't know the full story, but I uh, my understanding is she settled in Trinidad and made right. uh, you know made her home in Southern Colorado. So. Yeah, there's a there's a lot of work that's being done to kind of try to figure out exactly what was going on with that whole thing, right? And so, yeah, it's, it's a Southern Colorado story. Mm -hmm. uh, so, uh, I think so. Elisa's asking if uh, we have any book recommendations to share with elementary or junior, senior, high school students. I don't know if you do, Dr. Sawyer. I know at the I'll just put a plug in for our bookstore at the Fort Garland Museum. We've got a handful of uh, children's books that talk about, um, you know, this history that I don't know that the title's off the top of my head, but, you know, we can certainly, you know, share that if you just drop us a message. But Dr. Sawyer, I don't know if you've got resources for younger children. Yeah, I, I hadn't really done that, but I, typically these are things that you find in these museums. So that's what I'm saying. Eric is exactly the person to be asking about that, because that's where you find those kind of resources. And it's critically important. It's so important that, that you know, uh, Grant elementary, middle school, and high school teachers begin to kind of push this history into conversations at that level. Because I think it's just really important to begin having that conversation before people end up in college and we have to start starting all over from scratch. So that's why this kind of uh, talks are so important, I think, these gatherings. We have a question from a, from a colleague of mine, Maya Kronfeld. Uh, let's see. When it comes to Buffalo soldiers, the humanity of soldiers celebrated early or with on without any discussion of citizenship. Does, it, does that mean that recognition of personhood and citizenship are so not so bound together as we might be led to believe? Yeah, I think that's exactly what's going on here, right? Because, and this is this is foundational to Douglas's argumentation, right? Because Douglas believed in many ways he was a, a Frederick Douglass was a believer that the Constitution, if if followed properly, the notion all men are created equal would therefore uh, render African, formerly enslaved Afri people of African descent full citizenships and if they were considered to be human and men, right? What we're seeing now is that's not necessarily the case, is that the, the notion of citizenship is still at some remove from the notion of, of humanity or personhood. And that's the big struggle, right? Because even if you go back to kind of French, French thought, this notion of the rights of man and citizen, right? It's not or the two things have to go together. And the question of putting them together has been a complicated uh, situation in the United States since you know, 1789, at least in the, in the ratification of the Constitution, that is so marginalized by what Madison was thinking about in Federalist, about the way in which um, he understood people of African descent to only be fractionally human. So we're getting close to running out of time, but I also want to make sure that we have an opportunity uh, for you to talk about uh, some of your other research, uh, maybe not uh, directly related to the Buffalo Soldiers. I know you've got a book that just uh, was published early this spring, if I understand. Do you mind talking about the book and then maybe some of the other projects you're working on? Yeah, I mean, the, the most recent book I published is about Malcolm X and really takes up, it's not at, at, at a tremendous amount of distance from this question that we're having now, right? So the book is called Black Minded the political philosophy of Malcolm X. And, it's to, and it actually deals with these questions that Malcolm X happens to be asking 
is, and his foundational question is, how do you achieve uh, full citizenship under conditions of coercive threat? And so his, his, his most important innovation, innovation with respect to that was considering human rights rather than civil rights. And to say that before you can even start thinking about this question of civil rights, civic participation in, in a system of governance, you first have to be recognized as human. And he wanted that recognition to come from international authorities like the uh, International Criminal Court, the UN, and those types of organizations to create a kind of transnational existence for uh, African Americans who didn't have, in his mind, a real place uh, of indigeneity. So that's what I've been working on most recently. The uh, finish that and it's, it's out. It came out in March, I think. Uh, I'm working on a variety of different projects now. The most important, I'm working on a, a museum project. Actually, it's a sound installation that takes up the question of police violence in our society that I'm really excited about, that I'm trying to pull together over the next couple of months. Everything's been destabilized because of COVID-19, not being able to travel or meet with people. And I'm working on a, a another book that basically thinks about the uh, philosopher uh, Hegel, the German philosopher Hegel, and his his works, the phenomenology of spirits, presence in a lot in a in a variety of African American systems, Africana systems of thinking, whether that's W. E. B. Du Bois, uh, France, Fanon, et cetera. So that's what I've been up to. So I'm gonna uh, two more questions here, very different. Uh, but one person, uh, Julie, who's with our organization, is asking uh, if you could just talk a little bit more about the museum project. Where is that? And then I'll ask you the other question. I know you talked about this uh, briefly in your presentation. It's about the term and the origination of Buffalo, Buffalo Soldiers. Uh, I know that's uh, been a point of discussion, but can you talk about uh, some of the, the, the thoughts and theories around where that term came from? Yeah. Yeah, I'll take the last question first and then talk about this museum project. The uh, Buffalo Soldier, so some people say that it's because that the indigenous people saw the, the way in which African-Americans hair uh, curl, was curly and thought that it reminded them of the, the buffalo, right? That's one place that it comes from, right? So one may or may not consider that derogatory depending upon whether you consider African-American people's hair to be, you know, marginalized in that way. And what they thought about it was just descriptive as opposed to, um, meant to marginalize, I would imagine, not having, and, th and again, this is, this is much about, you know, a lot of this is apocryphal, right? This is one of these, these things that comes out of kind of, comes out of nowhere. Uh, some of it has to do with skin color, this notion that, you know, uh, black people are brown in the way that buffalo are brown, those kinds of things become the way in which that people argue this. And also, some of it is also considered to be laudatory in that the importance of the buffalo for the plains particularly speaks to this notion of, of you know, endurance, uh, you know, strength, et cetera. So, that, so all those things kind of put together. And there's been no, as far as I can tell, there's been no real um, possibility of unearthing exactly what all that means. So that's what I, that's what I think is going on. Uh, to Julie's question. So the museum po project, I'm calling it uh, Stop Resisting um, Eight Minutes and 46 Seconds. So basically it's a sonic installation. I'm working on this with, uh, uh, a musician, Nicholas Payton, who's composing music to go along with it. So we'll, what we've done is we've taken incidents of, of police violence and stripped only the sound of them and, and put them together. And it, it creates this kind of soundscape that is jarring in a particular kind of way. And he, he's adding music to it that then becomes a way of kind of interrogating the existence of the blues as a type of lamentation. So the, the project is, is, is built as lamentation uh, colors darker than blue, shades darker than blue, to think about uh, just what it means to kind of hear people on the course of threat rather than the kind of omnipresence of seeing it. So as far as where it's going to be, it's originally going to, uh, we're talking to uh, San Francisco Jazz about having it uh, be part of a suite of things there. And also we're working on having it here at the Colorado Springs Fine Arts Center at some point in the future. So that sounds, that sounds really fascinating. Uh, Dr. Sawyer, thank you so much for joining us um, this evening. It was a pleasure having you. Unfortunately, we're kind of winding down. Um, you provided some amazing insight uh, and a great evening. So I also want to thank everyone who joined us out there uh, this evening who made time uh, to, to be with us.
here. Uh, thank you again to the Sangre de Cristo National Heritage Area, to Colorado State University Pueblo, and all of our donors and supporters for supporting public programming at all of our History Colorado community museums. As I mentioned at the beginning, we've got a few uh, talks coming up this fall um, that we're really excited about. Uh, Thursday, September 3rd, we get to have a really a great conversation with Dr. Roberto Montoya, who's a, a, a adjunct professor at the University of Colorado, Denver, also um, has done a lot of really amazing work. Um, we're gonna take us on a really great conversation to talk about Hamilton, the musical. It's a little bit of a diversion from our typical geographic focus, but we know there's a lot of interest in this and we think some of those themes are gonna resonate with uh, issues and history here in this region. Uh, Thursday, September 24th, uh, we're going to be pleased to welcome Dr. Majel Boxer, who's a professor at Fort Lewis College, to talk about the history of the Fort Lewis Indian School uh, in Durango. So that's what we've got coming up. Um, again, thank you for joining us this evening. Uh, we hope that y'all have a good evening. Thanks a lot. <laughs>